Uh, we are live for our webinar session. A very warm welcome to all our viewers to the 17th edition of Cedrus Knowledge Series, an initiative wherein we have one speaker each month speaking on a variety of topics ranging right from investing to well being. We will now play a short video of Cedrus Wealth Partners. Thank you, Unnati, for the lovely introduction uh, and uh, welcome uh, Ajay and welcome uh, all our viewers for the 17th edition of uh, uh, Cedrus Knowledge Series. Uh, today's topic uh, uh, in uh, in today's scenario, I think, is uh, is an appropriate topic where we are seeing a lot of volatility in the equity markets. And, uh, you know, who better to uh, take us uh, um, talk more about this than uh, Ajay himself? Uh, so uh, I'll just give you a brief this thing. This is a moderated session where we will ask Ajay uh, Tyagi our set of questions. Uh, in the meantime, if our viewers have any questions, uh, you can post it on the comment box. Uh, we will take up to three questions which are relevant, uh, which are not been asked before, in fact, at the end of the session. Uh, so welcome, Ajay. Uh, thanks, Nilesh, and thanks, Anmati, for the introduction. Uh, so Ajay, you uh, you know we have seen uh, a, st a stupendous rally since uh, April 2020, uh, and uh, it was somewhere where it, you know when the pandemic happened, there was a lot of fear, and I think you know somewhere in 2021 you saw a lot of greed coming back. In fact, where you saw investors investing in the equity markets, uh, but since uh, December we have seen a lot of volatility which has come up. In fact, uh, you know we have seen markets. Every month, uh, uh, you know, fall and then uh, recover again. Uh, and, uh, you know, my first question to you is that, you know, with this heightened uh, volatility in the equity markets globally, uh, 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 due to, you know, high inflation, increasing bond yields, uh, geopolitical tensions uh, around the Russia, Russia and Ukraine, uh, do you feel this volatility will continue this year? And what advice? Where is you? Would you give our first-time investors uh, who have invested in equities uh, in 2021? Sure, uh, Nilesh. First of all, we have to understand that when we talk about investing into equities, what essentially does that mean? My sense is that a majority of investors, and I would say more than 90% of the investors, usually get this basic thing confused uh, about what is it when we say that you are going to invest into equities and equities as an asset class gives you the highest return over any longer period of time. Essentially, what this means is we are investing into businesses. And <clears throat> the uh, concept of equity investment started <clears throat> more than 300 is, years ago in, uh, in Netherlands, where, you know, the entrepreneur who had a great idea, but did not have the requisite capital would come forward and say that, look, <clears throat> I am ready to give a 50% or a 60% stake or sometimes even higher 
to some other uh, you know investors who are ready to chip in their capital and help me take forward this idea and you know that's how equity investing started unfortunately it has been reduced to uh, a more speculative activity today where most investors are trying to figure out what will happen in the next 6 months which sectors will go in uh, will go up in the next 6 months <clears throat> uh, would equity markets see a correction over the next 6 months or would they give you know their average uh you know 14 to 15% kind of returns that we have seen over the last one decade or two decades on an average you know unfortunately all of these things lead to a big amount of disservice to the attempt towards creating long term wealth that all of us wish to see that that we wish to actually uh, give to our investors that you wish to you know uh, create for your set of investors and to the end investor himself so i think uh, the lessons have to be kept very simple equity investing is about being a fractional owner in businesses and if you consider truly uh, yourself as a fractional owner in business then please don't bother about where the markets would be over the next 3 months 6 months or 9 months markets are there because they are there to provide you liquidity they are there to actually give you that capital when you actually need it uh, but other than that they are not there to let you know that look you can uh, uh, you can let's say invest into metals today because the ukraine russia war is happening and therefore there are supply chain bottlenecks and therefore metals will do well over the next 6 months and at the same time maybe you can sell off uh, private sector banks today because you know as a group they're not seem to be doing well and there's something uh, you know there seems to be an overhang if we continue doing this then i'm assuring you that we would not be able to create the amount of wealth that's our primary objective so i'm sorry for that long backdrop but i think this will just set the context for our discussion over the next 45 minutes please do remember that investment into equities is nothing but owning businesses it's nothing but being a fractional owner in these businesses our job is to basically find out which are those best businesses that india has to offer where you know from a 3 5 7 year perspective the maximum amount of wealth would be generated but this calls for a huge amount of discipline both in terms of identifying stocks and then patiently holding on to them now with this at the backdrop coming specifically to your question well i can only say that in the last 23 years or 22 years of my career i have noticed one thing which is that whenever markets run ahead and whenever valuations are expensive markets generally would try to look for a reason to actually see a correction in those valuations and we've all known as you rightly mentioned uh, you know 2021 was a year which uh, you know went up pretty much like a rocket uh, many of us were suspicious about uh, the valuations we still are by the way and therefore at this juncture like i said uh, markets will be extremely sensitive and extremely vulnerable to any negative news because of the high valuations at which they are trading and mm -hmm. news like the war news like increase in interest rates in the fed by the fed i'm sorry and news like increasing inflation both globally as well as here in india is providing the right kind of fodder for the markets to actually digest and therefore witness a correction i suspect 2022 may remain volatile may remain sideways uh, markets may actually even uh, uh, end up being negative uh, for 2022 but actually that doesn't matter to us from the longer term picture because remember our goal is to buy great businesses if these great businesses are available cheaper to us compared to what they were in first uh, of jan 2022 then actually it's that much better for us so investors should just continue with their discipline of investment through 2022 uh, because you're getting the same businesses but at lower valuation yeah so in fact you know uh, you know this brings us to uh, the next question because uh, you you mentioned that the valuations in equities is uh, definitely expensive and uh, uh, i remember last uh, year also a lot of experts expected uh, the markets to correct uh, uh, but the markets uh, in fact due, due to uh, due to heightened inflows from uh, retail investors uh, that in fact was uh, uh, that didn't happen in fact 
Uh, now coming to, in fact, I'll just take you to something which you mentioned that valuations are expect uh, are expensive. Uh, but what we have seen, uh, Ajay, recently is that uh, uh, you have seen good numbers come up uh, from corporate India, which which didn't happen since a very long time. Uh, after a long uh, 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 time, we have seen impressive earnings from Indian corporates. Uh, so. Do you feel there is a re-rating expected and that would cushion India from a, you know, a, a fall in case if there is a global correction? Sure. Uh, see, let me break it up into two parts. Uh, you know, the strong earnings that uh, we are expecting, which are already panning out and which we are expecting over the next one year, is also on account of the very poor base that we've seen over the last three to five years. So I'm not even talking about the uh, the the base on account of the pandemic but if you go even before that from 2018 to 2020 for those two to three years earnings growth in india was extremely soft much much lower than india's track record you see just like the economy goes through cycles along with the economy corporate earnings also go through cycles so if economy is is weak earning cycle would also be weak and if economy is strong earning cycle would also be strong so because economic activity post 2016 in particular for a variety of reasons whether it was demonetization whether it was uh, uh you know gst implementation which set the economy while it was while it was a very good move by the government but it did set the economy back you can imagine india's tax indirect taxation regime changing after uh you know 70 long years had to have its impact on the overall growth so GST implementation, unfortunately, the ILNFS crisis, which broke out in 2018. So a lot of these factors and finally the pandemic led to a, a, a you know softness in GDP growth and therefore softness in earnings growth. Now, mm -hmm. we are seeing a reversal of all of these things. And there is a huge amount of pent up consumption demand that is there in the system. And I think mm -hmm. all of these things would add to the earnings momentum over the next couple of years. So. Uh, to your question, is this a question? The answer is yes, this should be a question. But don't mm. uh, forget the fact that, uh, you know, if inflation actually rises uh, very steeply, it may have mm. a temporary impact on consumption demand in the coming quarters. So the overall mm. trend seems to be we are coming out of the soft cycle and entering into a strong earnings cycle. Can inflation mm. raise coil sport over? Uh, a couple of quarters in between, the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Actually, you know, uh, this is something which uh, the reason why we have seen that India has uh, recouped more, most of the losses when the markets actually corrected, and it's happened almost three times. Uh, coming to our next question, uh, Ajay, is you know, we have seen maximum retail inflows uh, in equities, especially equity mutual funds, uh, in the last uh, six months uh, of the calendar year 2021. Uh, most of the first time investors have invested uh, with the rare view mirror approach, which generally uh, investors do uh, when you have seen a big rally happen. Uh, yeah. So do you feel that as in the past, uh, the last leg of rally, you see a lot of maximum, uh, you know, maximum retail inflows uh, which come in. Uh, so do you feel this is a, a last leg of a rally and you can see a correction or this time it can be different? Nilesh, uh, people like you and me who've been uh, educating investors for for decades would always hope that this will always hope that this time is different, uh, because because the fact of the matter is we don't want investors to get excited at any point in time, particularly at the point in time when the markets are rallying, and therefore investors have this feeling that look we missed out, we were left out. Let us compensate for the investments that we ought to have done in 2020, but which we did not do. And let us therefore double up on, on our investments now. Uh, mm -hmm. On the contrary, what we want our investors to do is to have a very disciplined approach, keep investing regularly, uh, mm -hmm. consider investments to be nothing but income minus expenditure and the remainder being invested to create a very big nest egg. Uh, and that nest egg, of course, gets taken care by professional investors like us to create huge wealth over uh, over a 10 20 year period now mm -hmm. i think that perhaps there would be a bit of a combination of both i hope i'm proven wrong 
but but mm-hmm. but my sense is that we are not going to see a huge reversal like we have seen in the previous cycles because investors mm-hmm. are also maturing they are also uh, you know understanding the nuances of uh, uh, you know this game much better than what they used to 10 20 years back mm-hmm. so therefore to that extent i would consider a majority of the investors will continue with their sips but i still remain suspect about a small minority which may actually mm-hmm. want to uh, you know uh, take the exit door and would want to stay out during periods of volatility during the time period when market starts to actually give them a negative return on a one year basis and then wait to invest only when like you said looking at the rear view mirror they see huge mm-hmm. returns being made so can't rule out a small minority behaving like this but i do hope that uh, the vast majority uh, uh, is 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 much more mature today and therefore would continue with the discipline of regular investments rather than actually just looking at uh, the volatility in the market mm-hmm. when well, this time in fact you know i hope uh, this time would be different uh, but uh, I, you know one compliment to the indian mutual fund industry uh, i guess they are doing a huge uh, uh, you know uh, favor to the indian equity investors uh, because most of the investments which has happened this time has happened through equity mutual funds and direct equities in fact which we have seen in the previous cycles also uh, and uh, uh, i think that's something which has changed where investors are doing uh, sips uh, uh, they are investing in equity mutual funds and i think that's something which is which is uh, which we have seen which is different from the earlier rallies where you saw a lot of money flow into direct equities uh, so i think uh, right. that's that's one thing which is uh, definitely you know made a huge difference uh coming to you know uh, specific questions to you know the uh, the reason why uh, you know the current uh, 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 market uh, has been so volatile uh, and i think uh, uh, you know oil is something uh, which we need to look at uh, uh, when uh, you know because that's something which apparently uh, is something which takes away a lot of uh, you know the indian economy actually can act, uh, can derail just because of higher oil prices the growth story uh, so do you feel uh, my next question is that the oil prices can derail the indian growth story in the near term and what effect you feel would it have on equities sure then is that's an interesting one uh, you know i would draw, want to draw an analogy between this question and the previous question that you asked which was about mm. will this time be different and uh, you know our reply was that uh um, mm. this time hopefully a lot more investors would uh, would be mature because they have seen the cycles in the past plus the fact that uh, the efforts towards investor education in the last 10 years has been unparalleled when you look at crude i think while crude has been volatile has been moving up is already in three digits my expectation is that it may not actually remain in three digits for a long time you see between mm-hmm. now and 2007 and 8 that's the last time when crude went through the roof uh mm-hmm. and went into three digits and then of course mm-hmm. subsequently crashed the big difference is that the world has been able to actually discover a lot of alternate sources of energy uh right. not only in terms of automobiles which is 50% of the overall requirement of uh, crude oil or the demand for crude oil i should mm-hmm. say uh but there have been mm-hmm. other sources of energy uh which are trying to replace crude whether it is solar energy where, whether it is uh, you know wind whether it is hydrogen which is actually also now uh, uh you know picking up in many countries and is now being a commercial success and of course we all know in countries like europe and china electrics have picked up in a very very big manner you know think mm-hmm. about it Mr Gadkari makes a statement that 10% of uh, India has already moved I'm sorry uh, uh, Mr Gadkari makes a statement that India has already moved to a 10% ethanol blending without you mm. and I realize uh mm. you know the petrol that we are getting from the petrol stations has 10% ethanol mixed into it in certain cities it's 5% in certain cities it's higher than 10 uh nationally mm. we moved 10% which basically means mm. 10% of crude oil requirements for gasoline engines have mm. already gone down now mm. there are a lot of these kind of uh, i would say uh, longer term 
initiatives which have been taken in the last decade which are reducing the longer term demand for crude oil the prices mm-hmm. of any commodity are always linked to the long term demand and long term supply mm-hmm. there is definitely a much lower long term demand for crude and therefore my expectation is that crude can remain around 100 dollars but perhaps mm-hmm. not for too long right now mm-hmm. it has been more of a knee jerk reaction because of the uh, breakout of the war in europe but very mm-hmm. soon um, rational investors would realize that the longer term demand for crude oil is certainly going down so mm-hmm. uh, to that extent i would say not a big risk for india in the medium term in the short mm-hmm. term perhaps uh, there can be some risk but do remember we are sitting on 650 billion dollars of uh of reserves because mm-hmm. of the spike in oil if we mm-hmm. end up paying maybe 4 or 5 billion dollars more for uh, crude mm-hmm. oil it's not going to uh, you know uh, move the needle substantially for india it is not going to hurt the economic mm-hmm. interest of india uh, a whole lot yes in the short run sentimentally it could be negative yeah and i think you know the government of india has also been very proactive in their alternative uh, alternative energy uh uh policies in fact and we have seen a lot of proactive uh things happening from the government also uh you know my next question actually is on inflation uh so inflation has been in a double digit since last one year now uh how will this impact rbi's uh, stance on interest rates uh and in case interest rates rise uh, uh would it impact equities sure uh, uh, nilesh before before i answer this question i just want to set the record on this one when we yeah. look at inflation we should always mm. look at cpi inflation that's right. what so uh, very clearly the reserve bank of it reserve bank of india 6 years back mm. made it as part of their overall policy making that right. movement in interest rates would be linked mm. to cpi mm. inflation and not wpi and the reason is very very simple let me just hmm. take a uh, take an example you know hmm. the cost of a lot of these uh, bulk drugs which go into the hmm. finer final formulations that you hmm. and i consume so the final formulation could be a paracetamol it could be a ranitidine it could be a amoxicillin i mean it could be anything all hmm. of these drugs require what is known as active pharmaceutical ingredients some people also call them as bulk drugs the right. prices of many of these apis bulk drugs mm. and intermediates have gone up by 50 70 100% right what matters and therefore they are adding up to the wpi inflation because wpi is nothing but wholesale price inflation it's right. the and it captures the entire value chain um, mm. for for any manufacturer what mm. matters to you and i as consumers is cpi inflation which is nothing but consumer price index Mm-hmm. because the price of final drugs have gone up only by 5 7 10 20% percent and not 50 70 100% therefore mm-hmm. it is important to observe the behavior of cpi rather than wpi um mm-hmm. and, and if you look at cpi while i agree with you that cpi inflation has crossed 6% and rpi mm-hmm. is forecasting for the full year fy23 a number of 5.8% but this mm. is not very different from our longer term inflation which by the way is between 5 to 6%. If you look at mm. India CPI over 10, 20 and 30 years mm. take an average of that it is indeed between 5 to 6%. We have just moved above 6%. Now mm. if these numbers continue to inch up and 6 becomes 7 or 8 mm-hmm. then certainly it becomes a cause of worry but not before that. And therefore mm. today RBI is being cautious they may slightly increase interest rates in the next policy but it is still not uh, you know a huge cause of concern which will make them panic and which will uh, you know make them come out and say that look for us the enemy number one is right now inflation we are not thinking about growth and therefore we'll keep increasing interest rates i don't think we right. are in that scenario at all mm-hmm. but yeah. uh, do you do you feel corporate india is light on debt also absolutely Can So absolutely would that impact uh, corporate earnings if interest rates uh, uh, tend to rise how much would that impact corporate earnings now yes. so i don't have a handy number to uh, to yeah. give you uh, on that 
but but uh, mm. but i would second your observation which is that corporate india is very light on debt today because there has been a huge amount of deleveraging in the system over the last five, over the last 5 to 7 years corporate india has raised there was a huge amount of liquidity that was available in the last 2 years many corporates mm. have gone out there and raised equity money we all know this many ipos have happened many mm. qips have happened all mm. these things have led to a huge amount of equity capital coming in and therefore mm. repaying of debt so we are at a point of time where the debt to equity ratios for mm. uh, most companies are actually very very low and that mm. is going to help corporate india even if interest rates increase so it's actually uh, happening at the time when uh, mm. you know uh, we are not hugely leveraged but in mm. some sense we are under leveraged right you know i think you know uh, that will be a, a huge savior in case of interest rates well typically you know what uh, what has been told is that when interest rates rise equities generally tend to underperform and uh, you know we expect that you know we don't see uh, that happen this time but definitely i think as an expectation uh, the tone is right that we should not expect any great returns this year uh, maybe you know if there is a negative return also for a long term investor there's nothing to worry uh, absolutely so you know uh, coming to uh, you know uh, my next question is on the war uh, because you know we speak to a lot of investors and they all the first thing they don't talk about inflation or interest rates they talk about uh, what is the effect of war going to be on uh, on the indian equity markets uh, and it's uh, uh, one thing is there which i even read from, uh, that uh, quite a few uh, experts have not discounted the war completely in the prices which means that uh, you know uh, it's happened uh, many times earlier also where there was a scenario where it was a a, 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 a full fledged war which would have happened but it didn't happen and you know the markets fell and then they uh, they uh, there was a v shaped re re recovery which we saw in the markets uh, but this this time uh, you know given a scenario is I, I i i'm not telling we, we are expecting but given a scenario if there is a scenario where uh, there is a world war in fact uh, uh have we really discounted this volatility has discounted uh, you know that scenario or do you feel then the equity markets can uh, take an adverse reaction once uh, uh, it happens sure i'll tell you what the markets are discounting today hmm. the markets are discounting clearly that this is not headed in the direction of a world war and hmm. uh, and, and the reason for that is that there have been at least Hmm. half a dozen statements in the last two months by the us president or the us secretary of state that we will not enter into this war directly or indirectly uh, as hmm. recent as last week i think the statements made by them was that entering into the war is not in the interests of us so i think uh, hmm. while on one side they have been providing some kind of military support to ukraine but on the other side they have very very clearly made the statement that ukraine is not part of the nato and therefore mm. there is no uh, uh, you know uh, there they cannot be a direct involvement of nato and us in this mm. war so mm. i think that's what the markets are discounting if things change if us uh, changes the view overnight that will be a fresh set of uh, 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 you know fresh set of data that will have to be discounted and clearly that uh, that will that will have a negative impact on the markets because clearly we're not building that uh, into account the second thing which i want to very quickly tell you is that all the wars that have happened in the last 70 years or 80 years and this goes back mm. to the world war by the way all mm. of them had an impact over a 3 to 6 month period beyond 6 months the markets have been positive even mm. during world war 2 so the attack at pearl harbor led mm. to markets fall down by uh by double digits in the first 2 3 months but then after mm. that they went up again uh mm. france losing to germany again in the world war in the early 40s uh mm. led to a huge amount of uh, correction in the first couple of months but then the markets absorbed it and moved up again so even during the world war basically uh as events kept folding out it wasn't as if markets kept coming down they just digested the new set of data made a panic reaction mm -hmm. to it and then moved on uh, so mm -hmm. you know i would still urge our investors please don't look at the war and then decide your course of action uh, 
consider mm. yourself as a long term investor uh, and and then appropriately uh, invest at regular intervals in the market uh, yeah so you know uh, my uh, to continue with the same question is uh, in a scenario where you are seeing so much of volatility uh, does it make sense of, for an investor uh, who wants to invest in equities for long term uh, he invested in a staggered way or uh, does it in a tactical way whereby if there is a big correction that's when he enters the markets or he invested in a systematic manner over a period of time till this volatility uh, uh, gets over nilesh i would say without batting an eyelid it will always have to be systematic you see none mm -hmm. of us have a crystal ball in front of us the more time uh, mm. we spend in the markets the more we realize that none of us have the ability to call out the uh, moves in the stock market with any amount of uh, uh, consistency and predictability we may get it right. right once we may get it right twice but if you ask any one of us have we do we have the ability to get it right every time the answer is absolutely no and therefore uh, you know i i really don't want to uh, let investors know that any one of us have this ability and in case we don't have the ability what's the next best course of action it inevitably is that be systematic that's the only scientific way of spreading out your investments rather than being presumptuous in terms of uh, saying that look i know that the markets will correct 10% therefore i will invest my money only then uh, that's not being scientific at all and that's being uh, too presumptuous and too emotional about uh, the direction of the markets the only uh, mm -hmm. consistent way is making sips either at a monthly reset or at a quarterly reset but uh, i i would say that's the best way yeah in fact we at cedris uh, you know we believe in having strategic allocation to equity than a tactical you know, you know when you invest you invest in a strategic way uh, uh, taking into account your asset allocation then just invest tactically that the markets have corrected and let's go and invest and try to make a quick buck in fact correct so uh, you know ajay uh, uh, next question is actually on uh, small and mid sized companies where there is a lot of excitement which got built it got built earlier then you saw uh, you know that uh, small and mid cap companies underperformed in 2020 uh, and again we have seen a good rally in small and mid sized companies uh, uh, it is uh, backed by good numbers also there are a lot of uh, mid, mid sized and small sized companies have come out with very good numbers uh, so my next question to you is, uh, with such, you know, with the huge rally which we have seen, uh, specifically in 2021 in the mid cap space, uh, how should investors approach this space if they want to, uh, you know, if you want to invest? So just for example, if someone wants to invest in equity, you know, and uh, he has a horizon, uh, a long term horizon, how does he approach this space of mid and small size companies? Sure. Uh, Nilesh, I think we started the discussion uh, with a very quick uh, background on where the markets are in terms of valuations. Mm -hmm. uh, in that context, mm -hmm. let me get a little more deeper uh, in terms of the valuations of the market when broken up into large, mid mm -hmm. and small. And there the observation is mm -hmm. that while at the very high level, markets are overvalued, and therefore, they're, they're looking at a reason to actually uh, uh, see a correction. But when you peel the onion and look at large, mid and small, I would say small mm -hmm. is the most overvalued. Relatively mid mm -hmm. is less overvalued than small. And relatively large mm -hmm. is less overvalued than mid. While all three of them are overvalued. So if there were to mm -hmm. be a correction, I think... Uh, 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 looking at the valuation ranges, I suspect the correction would be the most in small caps, relatively lower in mid, and the least in large. It doesn't mean that large won't go through their bout of correction. So uh, mm -hmm. you need to keep this in mind when looking at uh, creating client portfolios over the next six months to nine months. From a longer term perspective, although, uh, you know, uh, having some allocation into mid caps and small caps has generally proved to be uh, worthwhile from a risk return mm -hmm. perspective. Uh, and, and therefore, we always encourage our investors to have some allocation into mid cap funds. It all depends on the unique client circumstances. So we would not ask an investor who's 60 or 70 years of age mm -hmm. uh, to actually mm -hmm. have an allocation to mid caps. I mean, that can be covered by a variety of our funds. 
which anyway have 15, 20, 25 percent allocation to mid caps themselves rather than directly investing into a mid cap fund and certainly not investing into a small cap fund. But equally for a 25 year old youngster who has just started job, a reasonable mm. exposure into mid caps is something, uh, you know, uh, we think would uh, would be the right thing to do. So it will have to be a little more nuanced and a little more uh, context uh, specific. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, 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 you know, get it right. Actually, it's uh, is uh, you know the, the valuation wise also small caps are the uh, most overvalued. Uh, so definitely, you know, uh, uh, investors should have uh, uh, allocation to small and mid size uh, funds, but uh, uh, definitely they cannot have a huge allocation to uh, these yes. kind of funds. In fact. So coming to you know sector specific actually because uh, typically you know in this scenario you know we have this question coming from investors that uh, do we get into defensives you know there's uh, inflation there's interest rates uh, 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 the war like scenario the war is already on uh, and FMCG used to be uh, or is maybe it's a defensive even today uh, we have seen in the last two three years uh, FMCG apparently has actually given. Uh, hardly any returns when the markets rally and uh, definitely a defensive nature is good but then you can't expect any returns uh, not coming from this space uh, but do you feel that fmcg based on the valuation front also uh, uh, does it actually uh, you know in this scenario make sense being in a uh, fmcg uh, uh, sector and uh, uh, coming to the funds which you are managing you know uh, uh, in uti uh, how are you approaching this FMCG uh, space? So, Nilesh, first of all, uh, you know, I would say that uh, one year is a very short period of time to assess the returns by any particular sector or a group of companies. We started the mm. discussion by your opening remarks about how great 2021 has been and how markets mm. just went up like a rocket and there was a huge amount of indulgence in risk. No prizes mm. for guessing, therefore, that the best performing sectors of 2021 have been metals, real estate, mm. infrastructure, and PSUs. The, the, mm. the typical sectors which you can always imagine would be at the forefront when investors want to take on risk. And during right. such environment, sectors which will always be underperforming would be uh, the more stable sectors, the much more... Uh, well-managed companies, the low beta companies, as we call them, which would be FMCG companies, mm. co consumer companies in general, I would say healthcare and pharmaceutical mm. names, the more mm. well-managed private sector banks and so on. Uh, so, mm. so that doesn't come to me as a surprise. And therefore, in a risk on rally, do expect FMCG companies to not do well. When we mm. uh, invest in our portfolios, it is never with the intent of, look, what will do well? Uh, on the backdrop of, in the backdrop of whether it's going to be a risk on or a risk off environment and therefore mm. where should we invest. On the contrary, right. we always right. invest from a three to five year perspective saying that, look, is the demand for, let's say, the kind of products that Nestle makes going to increase mm. over the next three to five years? Is the penetration of the category of products where Nestle is in going to increase? Is there any competition mm. coming in uh, directly? Uh, uh, to to actually uh, uh, lead to lower margins for Nestle or not. And these are the kind mm. of uh, longer term or medium to longer term issues that we contemplate before making investments rather than whether the stock price of Nestle will do well or not. So uh, right. from a medium to long term perspective, India's consumption story, I think, has barely begun. We have just scratched mm. the surface. These companies, as you all know, have been the huge wealth creators of the last 10 years and 20 years very very mm -hmm. solid businesses very solid brands have the ability to take price increase generate huge amount of profits and cash flows so uh, you know we are across our different funds in a different mm -hmm. uh, quantum of course and a different mm -hmm. promotion a uh, proportion i'm sorry are bullish on consumers uh, consumer specific or fmcg companies in general okay Vulnerable. In fact, you know, uh, a lot of investors do invest in FMCG uh, sector funds and, you know, you have MNC funds. UTI has one of the MNC funds also. And, uh, you know, this is a question on behalf of the investors who typically ask that, you know, is uh, uh, who if they want to invest today, would defensives be a better option to invest? In fact, 
and uh, thanks for giving uh, uh, the, your views on it. Uh, coming to actually, my next question is on uh, uh, you know on private sector banks. Uh, you know the core bank, private uh, banking business, uh, uh, banking business of private banks have done well. Uh, definitely, they will be hit by uh, lower treasury incomes. In fact, but uh, you know uh, you have seen uh, this sector underperform uh, the markets uh, in spite of uh, you know having cleaner balance sheets and uh, stronger balance sheets. Uh, so, how do you approach this uh, sector? Uh, in some sense, uh, Nilesh, the answer to this is linked to uh, you mm. know the previous question that you had asked. Yeah. Private sector yeah. banks are those very well managed, well oiled banks, uh, which have mm. always uh, you know uh, uh, moved up like clockwork in terms of their path towards growing their deposits, growing their advances book. So it's almost like clockwork if you look at their balance sheets, their income statements over the last uh, ten years or. Uh, in fact, I would say, why not uh, 20 years, actually? So, uh, you know, mm. extremely predictable. And yet where the country is today, the uh, credit to GDP ratio, which gives you an idea of credit penetration in the economy is very, very low, very, very subpar. I think these mm. banks will continue to do well in the coming decade as well. Just to give you mm -hmm. a context, in 1991, when private sector banks were given licenses, because, uh, because the country had already nationalized all the banks in... Uh, uh, in, in the late 60s. Um, mm. So uh, what we had in 1991 were basically 97% of the market controlled by nationalized banks like SBI, PNB, Canra, Syndicate, so on. And only 3% of the market was in the hands of Citibank, HSBC, Standard Chartered, and some of the age-old uh, banks like City Union, Federal, and so on. Today, mm. after uh, 30 years, Private sector mm. banks are controlling 30% of the market from zero to 30 in 30 years. I have absolutely right. no doubt in my mind that uh, the next generation would not want to bank with SBI, PNB, Canra, but would want to bank with ICICI, HDFC, Axis, and so on. This 30% mm. market share will increase to 40, 50, and 60. And again, mm. like clockwork, these people will increase their pool of deposits, increase their pool of advances. And they will continue uh, in their journey towards becoming bigger and therefore creating wealth for their shareholders. What happens in one year is something, like I said, is is always in the realms of speculation. So, like uh, you know, uh, most risky sectors did well in the last one year. PSU banks also did much better than HDFC, HDFC Bank, Kotak Bank, and so on. So, I'm not very surprised by the typical investor behavior, but we have to mm -hmm. disconnect the. Uh, movement in prices over a 6-12 month period to the mm -hmm. business case for investing uh, you know, for the longer run. Mm -hmm. No, uh, thank you for uh, that question. Uh, you know, the question again was, you know, the typical FAQs we get from our investors. And uh, uh, the last question, uh, Ajay, is, uh, you know, UTI FlexiCap. Uh, so coming to uh, UTI Mutual Fund, uh, you, you manage... Uh, you know you are heading the equity division of uh, UTI actually and UTI FlexiCap is a fl flagship fund uh, uh, which has been in the top quartile since a while uh, I, I guess since the last five years if I'm not mistaken um, uh, so you know we have also uh, uh, have recommended uh, this fund to our investors uh, the only concern we have is one the high AUM uh, I'm sure you know because of the uh, uh, wonderful returns this fund has given You've seen a lot of inflows in this fund and uh, uh, you know you are at a high AUM uh, 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 basically uh, so how what is your strategy going forward for this specific fund uh, uh, you know citing the future headwinds uh, which would impact uh, the equity rally going forward so let me just take a couple of minutes to uh, to uh, run you through the core philosophy of UTI FlexiCap see the philosophy is very very simple in a way, I'm going to repeat a few things which I said in the last 30-40 uh, minutes. Equity investing is about uh, being a fractional owner in a business. The stronger the business, the better would be the outcomes in the long run. All of us uh, uh, here in this call would agree to the fact that if a business gives 10% return on capital, which means that if you invest 1 crore in the business and it gives you back 10 lakhs, it's a 10% return on capital. This business 
is certainly not as good as a business which is giving you a 20% return on capital by which you mean that you know uh, you invest 1 crore in a business and that gives you back 20 lakhs every year mm-hmm. and this 20% return on capital business certainly is not as good as a 50% return on capital business if you think mm-hmm. yourself like a longer term investor owning that business then your first uh, and foremost uh, i would say uh, tool to determine where to invest and what to avoid should be show me the return on investment or return on capital track record of the various businesses in front of me. If a 50% return on capital business is going to be better than 20%, which in turn is going to be better than 10%, then you ought to be investing much more in the 50% return on capital business. That is the heart and soul of our philosophy. Not trying to predict basically whether commodities will continue to do well over the next six months, whether crude oil will continue to spike and therefore should we be investing in energy? Will private sector banks continue to lag compared to PSUs and therefore should we underweight private sector banks? That's, I think, absolutely speculative mm. and, and we just want to completely avoid that. In UTI mm. FlexiCap, what we are saying is we will invest in the strongest businesses that India has to offer. And there is no doubt in my mind that HDFC Bank and Kotak are head and shoulders better than any of the PSU banks. And therefore, we will mm. never ever get disturbed by the fact that over the last one year, they have given lower returns than PSU banks. Uh, we invest A into high quality businesses. Quality uh, is mm. uh, you know something which you can measure in terms of return on capital that I just now explained in terms of very strong balance sheets with no debt. In fact, with strong cash flow sitting on the balance sheet. And if these are the characteristics that any business is displaying, we would love to own it. The second important thing that we look for Mm -hmm. is longer term growth. The business has to be growthy. Somebody can argue that ITC is also a great business, high return on capital, very high quality, no debt. But the fact is, and it's a good thing, that India is moving away from cigarette smoking. Cigarette consumption in India Mm -hmm. in the last 10 years has significantly come down. And cigarette consumption Mm -hmm. in India in the decades of 2000s came down compared to Mm -hmm. the consumption in the decade of 90s. Call it more awareness, mm-hmm. call it the huge amount of effort made by the government in order to educate uh, you know, consumers of tobacco and so on. Just like we keep doing the investor education, consumers of tobacco have mm-hmm. also become wiser by the day uh, looking at uh, you know, the, uh, the harmful effects of tobacco consumption. Now, that means that mm-hmm. the ability of ITC to continue growing at 15% is now impeded because at the heart and soul, despite whatever they do, 85% of their profits come from tobacco. Please always remember that. True. All of their other mm. businesses put together count only up to 15% mm. in terms of profits. So a decline in tobacco mm. consumption or decline in growth rates of tobacco is going to impact ITC. What we want in our businesses mm. is a long runway for growth. We should know why the growth will continue to happen over the next 5-10 years. And a combination mm. of these two things which is strong quality characteristics as well as strong growth characteristics when put together lead to us Mm -hmm. being positive and convinced about such businesses. The next step then Mm -hmm. what we do is start investing into these businesses from a longer term. If 25,000 crores appears to be big to you, let me tell you that in the US, Mm -hmm. the successful fund, 25,000 crores is nothing but $3 billion. The successful Mm -hmm. equity funds in US are 50, mm. 70, 100 billion dollars. They are no less than 50 to 70 funds in the US markets alone, which are more mm. than 50 billion dollars. And I'm repeating this no mm. less than 50 to 70 funds higher than 50 billion dollars. We have barely scratched the surface. The, mm. the size can become an impediment if you are trying to enter something, then exit it, then you know, look for an opportunity to make a quick buck where you again invest only to you know, uh, sell it out in six months. We are not attempting that at all. Our core mm-hmm. belief is be a owner of the business, behave like a long-term owner of the business, invest into it, stay invested for a long period of time. That's why our portfolio turnover ratio is 10 to 15%. All of these mm-hmm. things put together really don't uh, lead to uh, us being worried about the growing size. I mean, we can very easily absorb incremental capital because our approach is that of buying and holding on for a long period of time rather than, uh, you know, indulging in a lot of portfolio activity. So that gives us this confidence. 
no uh, in fact uh, uh, you know uh, it's very important that a lot of uh, there's a lot of misconception that uh, uh, size is something which uh, determines the return of a fund and uh, you know you have very with data point you have very clearly told that that's not the reason why a fund can actually underperform uh, just because of the size uh, uh, ajay thank you that was apparently our last question and uh, thank you very much uh, as always uh, for you know the candid views which you gave on equities uh, this will definitely help our investors uh, to take a more informed decisions uh, on equities going forward uh, now i pass it on to unnati Uh, who's waiting with her set of questions from the audience uh, like i mentioned uh, the, uh, there will be three questions which we will take from the audience and uh, uh, unnati can you can you please go ahead uh, that was an extremely insightful session sir uh, i'm sure your views on investing in equities as you know investing in a business and being a fractional owner uh and having the disciplined investments has given our view or uh, viewers a holistic perspective about investment in markets as a whole given the current times uh moving to the audience q and a uh you know in case if the us finds insecurities with respect to the global move to enter in the multi currency trade which is not restricted to the us dollars uh will any adverse action by us impact the indian markets and what will uh, the impact be on the dollar see we have been hearing about this for the last two or three decades i think ever since euro was born in the 1990s uh, we've been hearing about the death not the death of uh, dollar but at least dollar not being the currency of choice for global trade and there have been many attempts by by many countries over the last three decades so i don't want to uh, say that this can never happen first of all uh, you know i sincerely ascribe a low probability to this but yes should this happen it is abundantly clear it is negative for dollar dollar will depreciate and uh, you know from a uh, from that perspective india can act india has been having relationships with uh, with with a lot of uh, global partners so it doesn't come across as a big negative for us here in india but from a us perspective it could be negative should this happen but i really don't want to comment and say that this time it's certainly coming Unnati, you are on uh, mute. So my next question is that uh, you know because of the war-like situation and the disruption in infrastructure in the near future, uh, is any excess demand expected in metals and cement? Uh, you know, on the contrary, one has to understand that commodities are extremely sensitive to global growth. So if there is any one industry. which is the most sensitive to uh, uh to global growth then it is commodities whether it is zinc copper steel oil and so on if because of what is happening globally and also rising interest rates and inflation if global growth continues to be marked down and we already know that global growth is has been marked down significantly within the last 6 months it is going to be fundamentally negative for all commodities what we are seeing in the market today is more about uh, an emotional reaction or a speculative reaction to commodity prices but from a fundamental perspective markdown in global growth is uh, is is extremely negative for uh, for commodities yeah uh, right sir uh, uh, that is it from our end uh, on behalf of cedris wealth partners i would like to thank you sir and uti amc for making the time to grace this event and to all our viewers for tuning in in large numbers and making this event a success uh, we will return next month with a new topic and a new speaker until then stay healthy stay safe and happy investing thank you sir thank, thank you very much and thank you everyone thank you, thank you.